All right. Well, hi. I'm Dennis Nicholas from Fermilab, and uh, so we're going to tell you a little bit about um, Erlang usage at Fermilab here, as Mauden said. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to explain a little bit about Fermilab science mission and then kind of give you an idea of how our Erlang efforts fit into that science mission. And then Rich is going to go into more detail about one of our Erlang applications that you know we're relying on here for uh, running our particle accelerators. So we're here at Fermilab, and uh, as Lauden mentioned, uh, Fermilab is the premier high-energy physics laboratory in the United States. We're a campus of about uh, 11 square miles and uh, completely devoted to basic science research here. And in this aerial, aerial photograph, you can see this uh, ring in the foreground is one of our um, accelerator rings called the main injector. Um, this is our high-rise headquarters building here called Wilson Hall, and Rich will mention that also uh, briefly at, towards the end of the talk here. So we're a high-energy physics laboratory. Just what exactly does high-energy physics mean? So high-energy physics to us means we accelerate protons or other particles to a very high energy to nearly the speed of light. We crash the protons into other things and look at the result. Sometimes we crash the protons into other, part, other you know, antimatter protons or other particles or other times into a fixed target. This generates uh, daughter particles that are really what we're interested in studying. And so uh, through this methodology, we study the extremely small. We split the atoms apart, split the protons apart into their constituent quarks and uh, look at the very you know, fundamental particles that are um, making up matter. This also lets us uh, study um, thing information about the extremely large on a cosmological scale, you know, understanding how particles work. We're also recreating conditions near the uh, beginning of the universe and trying to study, you know, uh, the fundamental nature of the universe and cosmology also here. Okay, so part of the particles we exp um, have experiments running on are one of the particle types is neutrinos. So we generate neutrinos with our particle beams here. We send the send the neutrino, so we make the particles here, we send the neutrinos through the earth to our detectors up in nor nor northern Minnesota. This is a diagram of one of our uh, NOVA detectors there. This is about the size of a barn, just to give you some, some idea. Then we also have other on-site detectors for neutrinos. We have uh, mini boon and micro boon, which are you know, very much scaled down from what the NOVA experiment has there. Um, Neutrinos won the uh, Nobel Prize in Physics this year. Different neutrino experiments, not ours, but so it's a very exciting field to be studying. We're also studying a type of particle called the muon. Muons are sort of like electrons, only here. We've got a, two major muon experiments coming online in the next few years. The G-2 experiment involved moving a giant uh, magnet from Brookhaven National Laboratory to here couple of years ago and we're working on getting that installed and getting a beam into that. Uh, our other ex muon experiment is called mu to e for muon to electron conversion. There's a little schematic of that uh, detector on the lower right there. We also do a lot of fundamental research in accelerator technology. Um, we're a key research institute for doing superconducting RF cavity uh, investigations. And that's kind of what's shown on the left here. We also have a facility called FAST, and they're building a new uh, test ring called IOTA to test different fundamental aspects of accelerator technology. Uh, Fermilab is a member of several large international and local US collaborations. We're a key player in the LHC and the CMS detector at the LHC at CERN. We're also, within the United States, we're supplying some of the cryo modules for the LCLS2 detector at Stanford uh, Slack laboratory out at Stanford. Um, also, besides us collaborating externally, there are hundreds of uh, international collaborators that come here to join in Fermilab's efforts in science. We do do a couple of non-accelerator based experiments. We recently built the world's largest digital camera, the dark energy camera, which is mounted on a telescope in Chile. We're a key player in the production and data analysis for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, locally here, we have a 
smaller experiment called the Holometer, which just uh, released some inter interesting results a couple of weeks ago. But uh, you know, we do have some non-accelerator uh, experiments, but most of our focus is on accelerator-based science. And here's a diagram of our accelerator complex. So we have a sequence of accelerators which uh, pr push the beam, the proton beams, to higher and higher energies, and then release them to the experiment. So we start off down here at our ion source. We literally start with a bottle of hydrogen. Then it goes through our linear accelerator, the LINAC, which goes it up to a little bit higher energy uh, at 15 hertz rate. Um, then that is injected into our booster accelerator, another intermediate accelerator ring. Out of the booster, we go into the recycler ring. The recycler ring is really just an accumulator for, uh, for the protons until we get a lot of them accumulated, and then we inject them all at once into the main injector. The main injector uh, boosts them again up to a higher energy, again approaching the speed of light. And out of the main injector, we can send particles to our various experiments, to the muon experiments, to some of the neutrino lines, to other fixed target experiments. We can also bypass the main injector entirely and uh, go directly to some of our other, like the local uh, mini-boon, micro-boon experiments that I mentioned earlier up there. Okay, so that's Fermilab as a whole. And so how do Rich and I and the, uh, our efforts in Erlang fit into all this? We're in the accelerator controls department, and so what what we do is in order to monitor and control the this you know very huge complex of machines, we have put literally hundreds of thousands of channels of data collection all around you know the accelerator rings at various points on the accelerators and uh, the detector and the lines transfer lines going in between those to uh, monitor all types of things from the basic things like temperatures to beam positions, to voltages of various power supplies and magnets. So we're in charge of the control system to monitor all that. And as part of the control, so the control system takes all this data streaming from the uh, instruments and sensors on the, on the accelerators. And we disseminate that and make it available to our main control room, to various displays and graphs that somebody might have on their desktop watching the beam, or to longer term archival storage. So in order to help understand what we're talking about here, we'll go into a little more detail about our accelerator control system. And so we've got several buzzwords or um, bits of jargon that we'll inevitably slip into here. And so just want to make you aware of them as we go along with this to talk the rest of the day here. So ACNET is the name of our uh, network transfer transport protocol. And uh, you know we'll commonly refer to the entire control system as ACNET just as a shorthand. Uh, an FTD, a frequency time descriptor, if, when I say that, really think of a uh, sample period for whatever data we're trying to read out. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that, but really it means the sample period. Uh, one of the key features of our control system is it's got a centralized database with, which holds all the information about every device in the control system, you know, where it's at in the network, uh, how much data is available there, how to scale it. Our data can be returned either raw or scaled into human engineering units. Um, we support both scalar simple devices and array or waveform devices. Our, our front ends, which are the parts of the control system tasked with getting the data directly from the sensors and get, making it available, don't usually have any database connectivity, and so they return just raw data, and re we rely on other services to do the scaling. Um, so a typical device reading request from a client will specify you know, the device name, the uh, frequency time descriptor or sample period, the byte length, and byte offset, how to get into the data. So our control system, it's a typical three-tier system, um, but it's pretty common throughout the uh, various labs and, labs and similar experiments. On the very top level, we have different clients, and clients can be anything from a our full application console to a simple uh, single application or a web-based application, um, some archiving of, of data or you know other clients, graphical user interfaces that the user might be watching. At the lower tier, we have the front ends. The front end computers are based on a different various architectures, but really their main job is to get the, the data from the sensors 
and make it available to the control system. The sensors, we have hundreds of different types of sensors, um, VME bus based sensors, uh, PLCs kind of count as sensors in our architecture, um, other more direct connections, serial connected devices, network connected devices, you know, wide variety. So we have a variety of front end architectures and uh, implementations to get those in, into the control system. In the middle is where we make the translation from what the control front ends acquire to the um, user interface at the end. So we have our database as the main service. We have other services such as the Tomcat server and alarm report and dissemination. And then what we're going to be talking about in more detail today that's implemented in Erlang is the data pool manager. The data pool manager translates all the requests for all the devices that the clients are making into messages to go to the various front ends and connect the proper front end to any request that it, that it has going on here. And so then how does Erlang fit into all this? We've implemented Erlang at a couple of different levels of our control system. Some of our front end computers use a Erlang based framework that uh, handles all of the lists and message passing and communication with the control system as a whole and lets us insert various drivers to communicate with the proper sensor or instrument that we have connected that front end. We have some smaller clients, not GUI based ones in Erlang, but just you know automated processes like a tuning algorithm or something like that that might be implemented in Erlang. And then in the middle we have our data pool manager. Again, the data pool manager connects the client requests up with the proper front end and then Rich is going to tell you more about our data pool manager here. Thanks, Dennis. So I'd like to first just talk about uh, the anatomy of uh, the data pool manager, and then we'll go into a little more detail on some parts of it, and then talk about uh, some issues that we've had and, and what we've done to, to get around them. So in the, in the data pool, um, we have another three-layer system here. We have uh, an interface that talks to the clients and keeps track of their requests and is responsible for shipping the replies back to it. We have a, a job control layer that does the scaling and everything, and then we have the layer that talks to the front ends. Um, so in this case, we have a client that's uh, talking to the ACNET service task, and uh, that ACNET service task will ask the supervisor to uh, create a, a client process that is now tied to that request and it will only talk to that client. And at this point, the external client and this client process will do some handshaking back and forth, building up the request, uh, trying to discuss which devices it's interested in, what FTDs to sample on, all that kind of stuff uh, gets built up at this point, this whole list. And then once all the information is put together, the external client will send a start list command that tells it DPM that it's ready to start receiving data. So the internal client process now creates a job and this job process is, goes to the list and does a database lookup for all the devices so it can find out which nodes they reside on, uh, whether the request is valid for the size of the data that these devices represent, uh, it'll pull scaling information, there, there's a bunch of information that it pulls from the database and then it also taps into our timing service because uh, one of the things the DPM wants to do is check the timeliness of the replies from the front end to make sure that all our front ends are returning data in a uh, in the expected time frame. We don't want stale data. We don't want missing data. So it the DPM will register with the timing service uh, based on the FTDs and the request so that it can kind of track and make sure everything's running smoothly. Once all that information has is, is, uh, been gathered, then it starts talking to a front-end registry, which is another supervisor, uh, Erlang supervisor process, um, where each of the processes that are spawned off are uh, you know, using a simple one-for-one -one, uh, behavior. Uh, the key for these for these child processes would be the FTD and the uh, ACNET node name. So at this point, when these requests go down, the front end registry can determine whether it's already spawned off a process that's talking to that front end with that FTD or whether it has to spawn a new one 
to handle the request. So, so if it's not there, it gets spawned, and if it's already there, then the request is just handed down to it, so it can just add it to its already active uh, request. So in this case, right now, we spawn off three as, a, as an example, and the three um, front-end worker processes now are talking to front-ends, and the front-ends on the data collection event will start returning data and start streaming data back, and so that data gets fed back to the job task. The job task, as the data comes through, will use the scaling uh, equations that it's pulled from the database, and then those those scaled uh, replies are sent to the client process, and then they're fed back to the, the client that's waiting for it. So we have this flow of data coming up from the front ends, getting scaled, and then sent off to the correct client. So one of the big responsibilities um, with the data pool, why it makes it a data pool, is it's merging the request to not only uh, keep the load down on each front end so that they're not handling thousands of requests for the same devices, but maybe just one request, and then we kind of disseminate the replies to everybody. Um, but that's that's the, the main reason why we have the data pool manager. But it also allows uh, clients to get a consistent reply, because when in the past, we've had some data pool managers uh, that were just on a single node and only handled a few clients at a time. And what would happen is the front ends would be returning data that wasn't exactly the same to all these clients because they all ended up being on different replies and they were all getting sampled at slightly different times. And by having a DPM that's more aggressively merging these requests, uh, everyone's getting a, con a consistent value and a consistent timestamp. So the, right now when a request comes down, uh, it gets sent down to the, uh, the front-end worker, and the front-end worker checks to see whether that client, the device the client's asking for is already in its request list to the front-end. If it's not, then it's, it simply expands its request and then resubmits it to the front-end, so now it's just been added to the set of replies. But if it's, if it's already sampling for that device on that front-end, uh, it has to merge the request. Uh, we remember the job's process ID, so it, we, we know who to send some of the data back for. And if the client's request, if their lengths and offsets for the data are uh, fit exactly within the current request, then we're all done, because the data is already being collected for it, and all we have to do is pick out the subset and send it back. But if the length and offset overlaps or is in a different, you know, it doesn't quite fit, uh, then the, the front-end worker will expand the request to, to accompany all the clients. It'll, it'll So, like, if one client were to ask on a, an array device and just want the first element, and then another client comes in and wants the fourth element, we'll expand the length and offset to include all four elements so that there's just one reading down to the driver, and it just has to return uh, more data. In addition to this, there's other constraints that we have to be aware of since ACNET is a UDP based protocol we have maximum packet size issues and so as we start expanding these requests and replies that go to the front end uh, sometimes if we're going to exceed the length then the front end worker will actually break off part of the request and, and actually manage two requests or three requests or however many it takes to handle all the devices but it does have to to monitor how big the reply, the expected replies are going to be and what the, the request is going to be. And then we also have the concept of fixed lists, which aren't really used much right now, but the client has a, an opportunity to say that his data cannot be interrupted or restarted. And so what we do for that case is uh, we won't merge a request that have a fixed list unless the length and offset fits in the current list. We just don't want to interrupt that stream of data. So this was a pretty complicated module when we were writing it, a lot of nested lists, a lot of, you know, making sure when tasks die that we clean up things properly and, and all that stuff. And so we really used EUnit a lot during this development, which was, it worked out fantastic. We really felt confident when we were ready to start using this. And in, in fact, it was, turned out to be a very reliable module where we've never had any issues once the system was in a running state. Uh, EUnit caught and kept us from you know, introducing bugs in the whole system. The one thing we found recently was that we weren't testing max request sizes, just the maximum reply sizes. 
uh, and we actually had a case where someone exceeded the request size, and so that was easy enough to fix. But uh, otherwise, it's been uh, eUnit was very very useful to us. Uh, when we scale data, the, the front ends typically, like Dennis said, they don't get they don't have access to the database, so they typically return everything raw. And so we have uh, scaling transforms that we use. Now we have two kinds of transforms: primaries and secondary. Uh, common transforms. The primary transforms are mainly uh, used to convert raw binary data into a floating point value and the common ones are able to uh, do some further scaling. Now the primary transforms, you know, you might think 43 sounds like a lot of them, but a lot of them are, are converting 2-byte integers or 4-byte integers to a float. Uh, you have to worry about endianness. You have to worry about if it's signed or unsigned. So that handles a lot of cases. And then a lot of transforms uh, were developed early on where not only did they convert those integers to a float, but they, they scaled it to common power supply values or whatever was available in the, in the early control system, like plus or minus 10-volt supply. So some primary transforms get you right to a voltage or a current just with the one transform. But a lot of devices needed more than that. So then we came up with common transforms, which will take that primary transform and then further refine it so that maybe we're converting a, a current into a magnet uh, field intensity or something like that. Common transforms can have up to six coefficients, and, and some of the common transforms are pretty ugly expressions, and it's amazing that some hardware needs something that that uh, complicated. Uh, we use uh, in DPM. We use some lambdas and closures to do this. Uh, here's an example of of one common transform clause out of the 44 uh, clauses that it would take to to do this. Like in this case, transform one is just a simple linear transform, so it only takes two coefficients, and so. We, uh, it re this returns a function that'll scale a float by just multiplying by slope and, and with the y intercepts Just a simple linear one. Uh, of course, some of these other values further on down, when you get to uh, transform 44, it's a really ugly expression. Uh, we, we don't have to, you know, in this case here, we obviously don't care about the last four coefficients. So this returns a, a closure that, or a, a lambda function that we can just add uh, apply a, a floating point value and we get our scaled data. Now when we look at the primary transform generator, like in this case uh, transform number 14, it expects a big Indian signed 4 byte integer and converts it just to a floating point value uh, with no scaling. And so what we do in our primary transform, this one clause out of 43 clauses so takes the transform number to match on and a common transform. And what we do is we take, as an argument, the uh, the binary that's coming from the front end, and then we convert it to a float, and then apply the the transform. So what happens is is DPM after reading the database, we end up with a function that we can take that raw binary and we can get the final scale transform in just a single function without doing lookups while the data is coming through. We just feed the incoming data right into the uh, uh, right into the transform and we're ready to send things out. And it, it gives a nice flow of through the system of data flowing from the front end to the front end workers through these scaling routines and then out to the clients. And you know kind of one of the things we can do is is in some of the more complicated expressions but like taking this simple expression we could do pattern matching to provide more optimal solutions like for instance if the offset in this linear expression was zero, we could put a zero here and just not even include it in the calculations because these constants don't change. Uh, now that doesn't make much of a difference for a simple scale like this, but some of the more complicated ones you can simplify the expression considerably if, if some of these coefficients were uh, ones or zeros or something like that. When someone updates the uh, da our database table and modifies one of our our devices, uh, the clients want to know about it sometimes. And we have a service called DB News, which is a multicasting service where database changes are announced and anybody who's registered for it will receive it. So DPM listens to this announcement and we're actually interested in two possible changes. Uh, one of the rare changes is uh, when someone locates a device onto another front end. Like maybe a front end only had a few 
devices on it because some things were retired and so rather than have two systems we can have one and we move the devices over. Uh, so it, it, it does happen, not too often, but DPM monitors, monitors it and if it sees that the device has moved it'll uh, close out, it'll tell that front end worker task to, to terminate and then it'll spawn off a new one from the registry and then it'll move the request over to that front end. A more common occurrence is that the scaling gets adjusted for a device. Maybe uh, you know the, the person who originally entered the device didn't quite get it right or maybe something's changed or hardware's been updated and they have to change the scaling. So here we monitor it and if, if we see that a device that we're reading has changed then we go to the database and get the new transform and just move it into place so that as the data streaming through it'll get it'll get scaled. And what's nice about this is we don't have to re-request uh, the data from the front end. It just kind of the, the, the data stream will suddenly start changing to the new scaling uh, scaling factors. Uh, we do actually insert a message into the data stream that says that device information has changed and it'll have some information about which device got changed. So clients, if they want to, they can be made aware that something has changed. But you know, a lot of status displays that are just doing updates, uh, they'll ignore that, that update message and just your, the data will just go to the new scaling um, factor. Our ACNET uh, protocol in the last 10 years we've added the ability to multicast requests and receive replies. So it's a little bit further than what just simple multicast datagrams do. And so we're able to multicast requests to multiple targets and either receive all the replies or in this case uh, what DPM does is he sets it up that only the first reply is received and the other ones are ignored. And so we can use this for service discovery. Uh, what we try to do is in the past we've had uh, the beefier machines would be our service machines and all the clients would know which machine had all the services. But now desktop machines are, are just as powerful as some of those server machines. And so now we're able to, to distribute the load and move, and move things around and, and we want to be able to add and subtract stuff. So now we've added service discovery so that a client sends out the service message and the first front end to reply or the first DPM to reply uh, will be the one that the client starts talking to. And so this allows us to bring DPMs down for software updates or if a machine needs to go down for servicing, it'll uh, uh, allow the clients to adjust. So when a DPM does get taken down, the first thing it does bef before it totally exits the system is it notifies the client that it's no longer can be used as a DPM. The clients that receive that special error status now can perform another service discovery and find the next uh, DPM that's available. Uh, we also use the service discovery and do a, a cheap form of load balancing where uh, when the DPM receives the service discovery request it will delay sending its reply based on its uh, system load. So what we do is we scale the delay between 0 and 100 milliseconds based on the load average and we clip it to 100 milliseconds so a, a really loaded machine will still try to send it off around 100 milliseconds later. Uh, the, the, it allows less loaded DPMs to reply quicker, and it, it works pretty pretty good. It works well enough that uh, we don't have to go into anything more complicated than that. Oh, and in fact, we have a, a quick quick little demo here. Um, right here, this is a, a parameter page where people can just type in devices while they're waiting for a more specific application to be written for their for their application. They can type an ACNET device name here and you can see that it's updating data and we can see up here that we're running the new DPM on CLX22 is the one that this particular client picked out. So if I log into CX, C, CLX22 and restart the DPM we will see up here that that this parameter page will switch over to another one and you'll see that the data will continue without anybody uh, really noticing. So if I stop it starts it up. You notice here we already switched over to clicks 20 and the data is continuing going. So it works really well. It allows us to take things down and, and applications adjust uh, you know, quickly and there's very little uh, delay or downtime. 
we right now we're using a custom reporting system that we wrote. We started with Erlang about four years ago on a couple projects, and one of the early things we did was uh, write a reporting system before we really knew what was available out in the out in the Erlang community. Um, when we report an event or an alarm, uh, there's a unique key to identify it so that we can merge multiple alarms together or multiple events together. Like in this example here, uh, we have a reader finite state machine update which with a PID so it identifies which job detected that the front end was kind of slow. Uh, there's also a formatted message that accompanies the key so that you can get a little bit more specific. Uh, the set function will set that something's in an alarm and clear will kind of say that the alarm has gone away and then we have a report that acts as an event. It's like a set clear really quickly. And so then at a configurable interval we will send a, a report via email to whoever's in charge of DPMs uh, and, and once the report is set we kind of clear out all the, the cleared alarms. But any alarm that's still in an alarm state, the set, will continue in the next report. But we are looking into other third-party or community-driven loggers and seeing if we can, you know, use one of those instead. The DPM uses a sync library to monitor. I mentioned this before that we, we like to monitor the timing coming from the front end. Uh, we have but different state machines that we use uh, based on which kind of event type they have to try to, to do this. And it's the same sync library we use in our Erlang front-end framework. And, and if a front-end as the previous slide showed, if a front end isn't responding timely enough, uh, a report is sent so we're aware that there's problems. When we started this, we were debating whether it should just be a standalone thing or should we try to make it into an OTP application. Uh, we figured we we should, well, we ended up packaging as an application instead of an eScript uh, just because we had some infrastructure in place and we haven't used eScript yet. Um, but it turned out that it, it worked out well that we went the application route uh, because uh, our control system up in Minnesota that Dennis mentioned earlier, uh, it needs a stripped down ACNET control system and so we didn't want to give them the entire infrastructure. And But they did need a DPM, they did need Erlang front ends, they did need some things like this and by making DPM an application, Dennis was able to just add it as a dependency to his front end and now it's bundled together in one virtual machine up there. So it, it worked out well that we chose this path instead of the other the other direction. Some of the issues, uh, more some of the more interesting issues, uh, things were working great and testing and as we initially started commissioning everything looked pretty well but then we had a, a client that started asking for a lot of data, a huge amount of data at a really fast rate and all of a sudden we became CPU bound and we uh, uh, started eating tons of memory. And it turned out that uh, our, our routines that were building up the outgoing packet for ACNET were using I.O. lists, which were great up to a certain size. The, the, the client in particular was asking for uh, 32 pieces of data with 8,000 data points, which ends up being a linked list of 8,000 data points and times 32 times 10 hertz. So it was a lot of data and as you saw in the architecture that there's some message passing going on so those data uh, data structures were getting copied from message queue to message queue and so it ended up being a lot of garbage collection and so after a lot of uh, you know analysis trying to figure out what was going on we ended up realizing that our mistake was was going into um, was making these huge lists like this so instead of making I.O. lists where uh, you know, we use a list comprehension to iterate through and, and convert all those floats, we ended up switching it to a bitstream uh, comprehension, comprehension. And that in itself made a huge, huge difference. It were, large binaries are just put in the binary heap and then references are copied around and there's a lot less garbage collection. And so that was, that was kind of a lesson we learned that I.O. streams are great. Uh, especially if you need to tack stuff onto the front of things so you're not doing a lot of copying. But you don't want to make every little piece of data a separate piece of an I.O. stream is, is kind of what we learned from this. And then plus we also found out that uh, even though the, the bytecode um, output 
use bitstreams pretty well. Native, the native compiler does a wonderful job building up these binaries. It really increased. We were seeing, at the worst case, we were seeing 80 milliseconds for building up these messages, and then it was like sub millisecond level once we had native and bitstream uh, binaries being built. Uh, we also found that merging was too aggressive uh, because we do have some devices where their length and offset parameters are not are, are nonlinear. They're not the offsets don't actually represent byte offsets because some devices take up more than 64k, and so they couldn't fit it in a single packet, or they couldn't represent uh, the offset in 32 bits because our early protocols had a 16-bit offset. So they start doing things where the offset represent which bank of data or which uh, you know chunks of data in, in some certain size. So we find these handful of devices on a new DPM uh, return errors when you try to merge their their uh, requests together. So I, the correct solution is to fix these devices because now our protocols have 32-bit lengths and offsets, but they're older devices. That's not a, quite a priority for some people. We have a lot of other projects going on that have our higher priority. So we'll get there eventually, but right now our current solution is that we do have a, a field in our database that we can use to mark a device as nonlinear, and then DP, we'll add a, a test in DPM, and we can use that fixed list concept to make sure that no one plays around or adjusts any uh, of the devices in a fixed list, which will be the nonlinear devices. So right now our three layers, we have an ACNET layer, the job, and the front end layer, but we have an experimental TCP interface as well so that, uh, for instance, like Python scripts can connect up to the DPM and get accelerated data. Uh, these are scripts that need to maybe do a little analysis or data collection, but they don't need the full ACNET services, so we don't have to write an ACNET library and make them a true ACNET client. We can actually just let them use a TCP interface and just get accelerated data. Uh, one of the other things we're looking into is we do have, we use RabbitMQ here for uh, uh, data collection for uh, some synoptic displays and that we might be able to, uh, we're looking into adding a, a RabbitMQ interface at the top level so that we can maybe provide a constant, uh, uh, be a constant producer of data for particular channels that synoptic display clients can subscribe to. Uh, that's a potential thing down the road. Now we also we speak only to ACNET front ends right now, but uh, there's another control system that most all other labs around the world use called EPIX, uh, and it, its protocol is called Channel Access. And one of the things we could do is uh, add a layer down there and so, so that the front end workers, we can have an EPIX front end worker that can speak Channel Access, and that would allow our control system to speak to both ACNET front ends and Epics front ends. And the reason why we want to do this is that uh, we have a lot of international collaboration going on and they invariably uh, give to us a Epics front end to drop into the control system and we've ended up either front ending them with a front end or uh, sometimes if, if there's not a lot of drivers even rewriting some of the stuff. But we'd like to be able to take their efforts and drop them right in the control system and not have that extra hop of data and uh, issues that that might cause. So. Uh, the the Epix uh, interface is is a very interesting one that we might pursue in 2016. So as not related to DPM necessarily, but as a group in our controls department, uh, there's a couple of things we'd like to do Erlang wise is is look at th more third party community efforts like Logger or Exometer. Um, those look like they can be very useful, and there's no reason for us to be trying to reinvent that stuff. We're also uh, finished up a, a trial for the Wombat um, tools for monitoring that, that we can use for our DPM and other Erlang base, so we're looking into uh, getting a license for that. And then uh, we, four or five years ago, rolled our own build system, which works for us, but hasn't really evolved too much, and so we should really be looking at things that, like Erlang MK or, or Rebar as a, as a way for us to to be part of a more active development cycle and, and benefit from those efforts. So, you know, we're preaching to the choir. Everyone here is interested in Erlang, but you know, we you got to say it's just a it's a real fun language to use. Uh, very interesting 
uh, language, very interesting, new ways of thinking, new ways of approaching things. And I find when I when I'm frustrated with Erlang, it's typically because I've I've made a, a function too complicated and it needs to be simplified and, and then it gets to be fun again and, and things work really well. Uh, and we also found that breaking a problem in a simple cooperating process, uh, it just makes the system reliable and scalable because each process is just doing one thing well and, and you know, talking to each other through message queues is so much better than trying to handle mutexes and other kinds. It's just, it, it's a really nice clean way to make a, a concurrent system. And also the Erlang shell is also very powerful. We're, we're used to using, in our, in our group, uh, we have a lot of VxWorks nodes. And using the Erlang shell is like a super powerful VxWorks shell. Not only do you get to do these great expression evaluations or even compile code as far as, uh, you know, creating new functions and stuff on the fly, but you're looking at the VM. You're checking process state. You're starting and stopping stuff. It's like it's a really souped up, OS, it's it's really cool, and the fact that you can connect the shell onto a remote VM is just awesome. Uh, we have used Erlang and some other projects here uh, besides DPM. DPM is the most recent one that we have done. Uh, we do have, as mentioned in this talk, uh, a framework for front ends itself. That's we probably have how many do we think we have up now? Twenty-five or so. About twenty-five Erlang front ends. Uh, mainly talking to network devices, uh, but we do have a few that are, are talking to hardware devices as well. Uh, the Wilson Hall, uh, the, the high-rise that Dennis showed you early on, right now the whole lighting system is running off of an Erlang uh, server, and uh, our lab-wide fire security reporting system has also been converted to a, uh, a Erlang system. So we're, we're really finding Erlang very useful, very reliable, and uh, really enjoy working with it. So I'd like to thank you for watching. Hopefully you all heard us because we don't get a whole lot of feedback <laughs> while we're going on. So first of all, I'd like uh, to thank Dennis and Richard for a very inspiring talk on their use of Erlang and generally on use of Erlang at uh, Fermilab. Uh, we apologize for some connectivity issues uh, we've had earlier. Luckily, not during the uh, webinar itself, which prevented me in properly introducing uh, Dennis and um, Richard. But I will briefly say that between them, uh, you know, you have nearly 40 years of experience uh, of working at Thermilabs and uh, a number of master's degrees and a number of years of experience of dealing with pretty much every aspect of software, uh, uh, you know, at Thermilab. So it's fantastic to hear about Erlang sort of at, at the forefront of this scientific endeavor. And um, what I'd like to do now is really sort of open up for questions. So just to say that, and this is another thing that we could not communicate at the beginning, uh, if you have any questions, if you wish to ask any questions of our speakers today, then you have the questions tab uh, at the webinar's uh, interface. If you use that tab, you can post a question and we uh, commit to answering questions in the order they were received. We only have a couple of minutes left, so we'll obviously try and answer as many questions as we can. So feel free to post them, and uh, we'll get to them. So to start with the first question um, that has arrived from uh, Simon, or Simon. Uh, so Simon is asking uh, Richard and Dennis, how long did it actually take you to build this framework? And what was the most difficult part of that work? The DPM application or the front end framework or the D I'm thinking he's probably talking DPM, right? I would think so. It's not specified, but it's likely to be referring to DPM, yes. Okay. So DPM, uh, we started it in spring, March-ish, I would say, and we've got the, to the point of pushing it out in the fall. So probably it was like six months. Uh, I, would, I would put it at about six months. Now, it's been in commission for a while. Um, we've only let, right now, by default, only the control system department personnel has been using it for the past year. Uh, recently, we've expanded it a little bit further so that more users are now, by default, using it, using the new DPM instead of the old one. The main control room is still using the old one, uh, but we're, we're slowly increasing the usage and and like re recently we found that issue with nonlinear devices from one of the users 
um, outside the controls department. So, so really about six months to, to put this system together, and then we started releasing it uh, to other people to actually start using. Thank you for that. Uh, we have another question uh, from uh, Richard. So Richard is asking, what is the sort of single most, uh, I would say the number one capability you personally would like to see added to Erlang to make it even more useful to yourselves? Uh, I <laughs> I'm actually uh, I actually like languages that have more static type checking and Erlang's dynamic nature is sometimes can be an issue for me because I like the compiler to catch if there's there's a lot of errors that I think that should have been caught by the compiler and I think one thing I'd like to see with Erlang is is instead of dialyzer being a separate thing I'd like to see the the compiler to include a little bit more static type checking because I think with the specs, you know, you can specify specs. I think there's a possibility that there's some easily caught errors that are, let, you know, that instead you got to kind of debug it. Um, so I, I think that's how I would. Think. I don't know, if Dennis, yeah, do you have I, any? I agree. I agree. You know, we we come from a C C plus uh, plus. I've also worked with OCaml and Haskell and. And it's really kind of nice that if it compiles cleanly, there's a really strong chance that that you're not going to have. You know, there's a whole class of bugs that get solved by that. And when I go to Erlang, you know, pattern matching goes a long way. Pattern matching does catch a lot of things, but there are some cases where even pattern matching won't catch a bug. And so I'd I'd like to see that. I don't know how doable it is or how feasible it is. Um, but dialyzer sometimes just takes a little too long to do every compile cycle to run dialyzer. So I'd, I'd like to see that rolled into the, the actual compile. Thank you for that. So uh, straight on to the next question. Michael is asking, uh, do you use any particular tools coming from Erlang for monitoring utilization of different parts in the DPM and also in terms of utilization and uh, bottlenecks? Uh, right now, our tools are fairly primitive. Um, so, and like we're looking at using Wombat now, which would buy us a lot of monitoring that we don't already have. Uh, we're we're using just really si system level simple things, uh, e even things outside of the VM, like like uh, you know PS and Top and some other Unix tools that can check a process. But then inside. There's just some of the statistics that you can kind of look at, but overall, uh, aside from our our report logging and things like that, uh, it's not as much as what we need to do. So we do have to get a little bit uh, better at, at that point, at that part. Thank you uh, for the, that. The yeah. one thing I, I might just mention real quick is is that if we do see uh, right now we have four DPMs running and they're all not hardly loaded at all. So I mean, if we start seeing performance problems. It's very easy to to start up an, another Erlang. We have over 70 machines to run them on, and so right now it's it hasn't been an issue because we have a lot of uh, expansion right now. But it is definitely something we have to look into. And I would add that you know operators are watching our control system 24 hours a day, and so we get, do get notified pretty rapidly if if something's going wrong, you know either even in the performance of the DPM or in one of the front ends or something like that. So. Thank you for that. So you did mention in your presentation your uh, sort of use of one button, looking into that. So that I guess sort of answers that question partially, as you said. Yeah. So yeah. just to say, we'll try and answer as many questions as we uh, can. We have a bit of an avalanche of questions coming in. So we'll try <laughs> to honor them as as much as possible. So moving straight on to the next question, uh, and quite an interesting one from uh, James. So James is asking, are your front ends Sensors only, or do they also control behavior of particles, etc.? Uh, well, yeah. So, so they do control the behavior of the particles as a whole, the particle beam as a whole. And the, you know, so like one of our one thing we might control would be a kicker magnet. A kicker magnet would fire and redirect the beam from one path down a different beam line or something like that. And that kicker magnet is controlled by our control system. And so, you know, we in that respect, and we do control particles themselves, and we have beam position monitors that measure the actual beam going by, you know, the electrical cur currents induced by the beam going by, 
by the sensors. We also have a, a auto tune orbit application that runs, and it it tells front ends to increase or decrease uh, intensities on magnets that are used to focus and steer the beam. Uh, there's there's magnets that are used to bend the curve around the ring, and then there's also magnets that'll uh, that have more poles on it so that the beam, as it passes through, gets tighter together because the beam has a tendency to want to, to split apart. So, yes, the front ends that we control not only do a lot of readbacks, but there are some devices they control that, that force the focus the beam and steer it around uh, the ring. So, yes. yes. Thank you for that. So, we, we have a really interesting question uh, that Yehuda is asking. So, we all know that Erlang uh, is known to be the kind of language uh, that is just perfect for quick prototyping and uh, uh, great speed to market. Uh, certainly from an Erlang Solutions perspective, we have a lot of uh, uh, companies and organizations we work with who pick Erlang specifically to sort of beat the competition and you know come to market first with their product. So Yehuda is asking, can you estimate the development time required for this particular project uh, using other technologies apart from Erlang? And uh, you know, what would your sort of uh, view on that be? Uh, I mean, certainly this could be done. DPM could have been done in any language. Uh, I know we started uh, a colleague of mine, and I started DPM uh, with C++. Which C++ is probably the primary language, although Java is a huge catching up secondary language at Fermi. Erlang is, is still the minority, but you know, Dennis and I are hoping that it uh, gets a little bit more use here. But So we started DPM with, with uh, C++, and we vowed that we were going to use all the latest language features and you know, no, uh, we're going to use smart pointers, we're going to do containers, all that stuff, and we were still getting seg faults, and we're we were getting tired of trying to figure out how we were violating some of these safe programming pra pra practices, and we already had a bunch of Erlang projects. So we said, let's let's see how far we get with Erlang, and we really started uh, moving along with it. So, you know, it's I think it depends on how how comfortable people are with the language they are is going to tell you how quickly they can get to market. But it, you know, a little bit of Erlang blows up into a lot of C code to do the equivalent work, and yet the Erlang stuff's more concise and understandable. I, I think the bugs are easier to find and are fewer. You don't worry about buffer overruns. You don't worry about side effects. You, you know, there's so I, I, it's really hard to, to give you a number like it'll take you twice as long or three times as long. I don't know if I can really say that, but but there's just a whole class of bugs that just don't happen when you program in Erlang. And it, it just makes you much more efficient. You can really focus on the job at hand. I don't know if that's a good enough answer. <laughs> Sorry. I think, I think that's perfect, and that reflects the feedback that we get from the market every day. So again, just to sort of say to our audience, uh, we are answering the questions in the order they were received. And I apologize, but we can only really handle two further questions. And uh, to quickly ask them, uh, a question from Anthony uh, is basically, are you planning to open source any of this? And are you looking for contributions from the open source community? I, uh, I doubt that uh, some of this stuff is going to be open source directly because there are a lot of Fermi specific things in it that no one would find useful. Um, I think though some of our, there are a few applications that we pull together, I think some of those we might be able to open, open source because they are a little bit more general. There's, there's a, like in our Wilson Hall lighting system, we have a, uh, a, a scheduler that, that I was thinking about pulling out because it, it has more widespread use. And in fact, I used it in the uh, 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 fire incident reporting system as well. So it, it was general enough that I can use it in both locations. And it might be useful to other people as well. So there's a couple subsets of it that I would look into. There's some legal stuff we have to go through. There's I gotta I gotta make sure that our technology exchange department. I follow all the rules that Fermilab has set up because we're a Department of Energy lab, and there's certain things that we have to follow. But if if they say it's okay, there's there's a couple of applications I think I might end up putting on GitHub and and uh, letting other people help 
you know, develop and improve and use. So, but not not as an overall. I don't think all of DPM would be one of those uh, applications. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we really only have time for a single question, and I think it's appropriate to finish on a bit of a strategic note. So James is asking um, a really interesting one. What is the future of Erlang at Fermilab? <laughs> well, I think we've we've tried to become ambassadors for it here, you know, and we've got a couple of other, other groups, other departments, you know, at least interested in you know seeing what we've done, and are you know at least started thinking about implementing Erlang uh, applications. Also, uh, we're definitely you know committed to continuing using it for these applications that we've developed here. And I think we see that spreading significantly, you know, as as our front, for instance, with our front end framework, we have, you know, I think, about like a couple hundred front ends overall. Only 25, 25 of those are Erlang right now. We expect that number to grow and the other number of older legacy systems to decrease. Um, we probably will start looking at other, you know, more of the client level, you know, applications like the tuning kind of applications that we can do in Erlang as, as we get it spread around and a little more proficient. And, you know, again, other groups at Fermilab are very, you know, very disconnected from us in terms of doing other scientific computing tasks. And, you know, we have, you know, tried to spread the word a little bit there and got a little interest. Yeah, and some of the other front-end uh, developers outside of our group have taken our Erlang framework and have installed it on ARM proce small ARM processors uh, running Linux, so so there's, it's already been moved in areas that we didn't actually do the development in. They're they're actually taking it and running with it. So it it's gaining a you know a little bit of foothold here and there, and and we're just going to keep pushing it. Thank you for that, and uh, that was the last question we had time for. Now I'm sure that all of you will join me in thanking Dennis and Richard for what has been a hugely compelling talk, and in my humble opinion, in very tough competition. Uh, the best webinar we've had uh, this year and uh, fittingly at the end of the year. Uh, now, I would like to invite you to join us again uh, for our next monthly webinar, which, we now, which will now be next year. Um, following today, we will send you a very short survey to make sure we capture your feedback of today's webinar. Please also note that the recording of the webinar itself and the presentation that was shared uh, will be available for you to collect on our uh, corporate website at erlang solutions com. Now, we wish you all a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year. Thank you all once again, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you.